Book two, auto off topic. How's it going, Brad? Uh, you know, just uh, living life out here in uh, the oven that I chose to live in. But uh, no complaints because it's good. All right. I uh, I just walked in the door from a track night, so excellent. Right in and recording. Perfect. Yeah, it was, uh, so it's fresh on your memory. It is fresh, and uh, it was Thompson again. That's the that's the one I did the beginning of the year. And then I skipped one I think was going to be at NHMS. Car was the muffler was blown off of it. So, yeah, inquiring minds want to know: Did you get thrown off the track for being too loud? Oh no, it's it's not nearly. It's there. There were Camaros that were way louder, like way louder. Yeah, I didn't figure it'd be an issue. No. Um. It's it's funny. Like so, I just keep doing intermediate because, um. The car is, it's kind of like the speed of the car is kind of the issue. It's not, I could probably do advanced, but my car is not nearly as fast, fast enough because. Well, no, advanced, you're going to be out there with people who are advanced and are driving four, five hundred horsepower cars. I was looking at the cars. It was literally all super fast street cars, like two modern Camaros, two C7 Corvettes, a bunch of modern BMW, turbo BMWs. Uh, it's So it was either those or there was like two completely race prepped Miatas and then a gutted race prepped Mazda 2. So, okay, so. you're either going to be a super fast street car or a full-on race car that you are <laughs> got a lot of grip in and you're ready to go. Right. You're ready to huck it into the corner and not worry about it as much because yeah. it's a race car. Um, but it's funny, like the first two, so the first session, I don't know, there's this guy in a modern Mustang, maybe he thought he could do intermediate, he probably should have been in a novice, but he definitely missed some sort of instruction with understanding to give people point bias. There was literally like a conga line of like 10 cars behind this person because The point of giving a point by is that the person in front of you acknowledges that you're going to go by them and they don't turn into you. Correct. Um, Rubbing is racing, but you weren't racing. No. Uh, So, of course, everybody's backed up because you're like, what is this person doing? Like, they just don't want me to pass them. Like, I don't. And they're just they were just like driving slow. It was really weird. And then like people were just like, he's getting the blue and yellow flag and like ignoring it. Uh, so then like a bunch of us were like, you, what happens? You, if you get bunched up, you just pull in the pits and you give them the signal of like, you put your hands together and then spread them out. And the, the people working the, on the pit lane for the SCCA are like, okay, that note, that's like the symbol for like, I need space. And sure. So they bring you, they shoot you down to the entry of the track. And then the guy lets you go when he sees a gap and you kind of get some space. But even doing that, I kept catching up to this pack. It was really weird. That's session. Not, he was going awful slow. It he was, was like strange. the track night equivalent <clears throat> of a left lane Prius. Yeah, it was like, man, like they should have pulled him off. Like, because they'll help you hopefully, out. Hopefully somebody talked to him after the first session. And I think they did. But then him... the second session, he was doing it again. Oh. And then at a certain point, um, if it was like safe, people were just going around him because he just wasn't giving point buys. Yeah. It's like, okay. <laughs> and then by, but then like it kind of opened up. And then by the third session, I don't know, maybe people left. I usually end up just uh, with like multiple laps with nobody around me. So, and I, I pay attention. And when a, like a 9 11 comes up on me, it's usually like point entering. By. It's yeah. It's usually entering the main straight, which I cannot keep up with them. So I just point them by and then keep going. And the thing is, now that I've been going to enough of these, you kind of end up with the same people in the same cars, and everybody kind of understands where everybody is. They so know each other's like, skill levels. Yeah, like yeah. the guy with the golf that was up by butt last time. Like we pulled out on track. He was behind me. As soon as he was like up close to me, I let him go. I didn't see him again for like the entire session. So yeah. <laughs> it's like Perfect. just 
And yeah, I'm still jealous of all these track days you're doing, never having done one. But yeah, uh, it's a good to way to start it. doing it. Um, but you gotta have a little gusto to do it. Um, and I don't, it was, there was like, like this nice shade tree because it was sunny and it was hot, and I'm sitting under it and it's like stands. And this guy's talking on the phone. I'm like, all right, whatever. He's just like talking to someone. And then I realized he's watching the track and saying like, all right, the person's in front of you, the person's behind you. I'm like, what is happening right now? And I realized he's talking to a guy in a G35 coupe, like his friend. Sure. And he's like his NASCAR spotter and he's in the novice group. <laughs> I'm like, I don't, I'm like what? And he was doing it every group. I'm like, I don't, I was like, this is so weird yeah it's pretty bizarre maybe somebody a, really a, a weird. newbie a newbie took it too seriously it's that was weird yeah that's strange that's a weird like thing to be like hey can you come to the track day and be my spotter yeah like i don't like, understand they think he's gonna actually race a car i don't know like there's definitely um People have never done them before, and they're just asking questions about it. And Which is fine. That's fine. That's perfectly fine. Yeah. And they're just like, where should I break? Where should I? And you're just like, well, just go out and stay on track. <laughs> like, just, yeah. Like, like, don't worry about You're not going to set any lap times here. Just find somebody who looks like they know what they're doing and just follow them for a little bit. But don't overdo it. Try to follow them. Well, they put cones everywhere. And they, they tell you that in the novice group when you run it. There's usually like an entry coin, an entry coin, an entry cone you can kind of point towards, and then an apex cone, and an exit cone. And that kind of gives okay. you the line. So you just kind of like look the this. real life version of the racing line in a Gran Turismo. Yeah. yeah and, fine. but anyway, it was luckily uneventful for me. Um, the car drove really well. I definitely need to switch to like 200 tread wear tires. Those, those poor Yokos, they're an excellent street tire and like fast road, like back sure. road tire. Yeah, they're good back road tire. They're not made for track to use. And the fact that they're as good as they are for track to use, and they're not made for that. It's a pretty good tire. Yeah. I've seen a bunch of cars running them recently. Actually, there was a, a very, 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 very clean R32 GTR at the Saturday, the last Saturday Cars and Coffee event, and it had a set of those tires on it. I was like, oh, sweet. They're uh, starting to show up other places. So people are... Oh, they're like the best 15-inch tire. Yeah, which I think this probably 16s on the Skyline, but still, it was definitely a, the same with well, the Yokohama Advan Fle, Fleva, Fleva. Flevas, Flevas. The, they used to be Fleva. S-Drives. Yeah, basically, they basically replaced them for the S drive, and they're a better tire than an S drive. But they're it's almost the same tread. They like, I think they updated the tread a little bit. Yeah, it's a they little. They changed the compound. I think the tread looks very different personally, but no, it's the same, almost the same. I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong. I picture it very differently, but that's okay. No, I think you are. I think you're thinking of like. The super sticky Advans or something. Mm, no, because I have S drives on two cars. So I know what they look like. <laughs> yeah. But they're almost identical. And when you look up S drives, that's what comes up. But anyway. Okay. That's fine. Um, yeah, they're pretty good. The new brakes I put on, pretty good. A lot better braking, especially oh, then with the cool. exhaust. Uh, the cars seem to struggle less to get to like 95 miles an hour. So. Excellent. Which I that's guess is for that little guy. What? That's cooking for that little car. Yeah, I guess that's pretty. That's a pretty standard speed for like, you know, 150 horsepower car. You know, Miata's do that. Yeah. yeah. It's like yeah, it makes sense. From the beginning of that straight till as late as I dare, it's like 95 miles an hour. Which is a good speed for a track day. You get your little, you know, your your speed fix in, and you're not going too crazy there. Yep. Um, does it um, suck down gas on a track day? Nope. Nice. I filled it near the house here. I actually drove it into the city because I did some errands first because I took the whole day off. I didn't work a half day. 
and then <clears throat> drove down there from the city, drove the track day, and got back to the house here, and it's a half a tank. Wow. Yeah. So that's why even I've been at, using this car. <laughs> even at five dollars a gallon, that's still like what thirty bucks for the fuel, so that's fine. Yeah, it's only like I a like ten it. or twelve gallon tank in that car. Yeah, that's perfect. Yeah, that's why I've yeah, been small using cars that. are small <laughs> cars are great. If I had uh, if I had air conditioning in my Colt right now, I'd be using it every day because, you know, mid to high 30 mile per gallon would be great to have that. Um, only thing at the very end, the check engine light came on. But you have a giant leak at your flex pipe still. Yeah, I would. I haven't checked it, but if I were to bet, I'd bet it's like a catalyst inefficiency because it's yep. the flex pipe is after the first O2. Sure thing. And before the cat and before the secondary O2. So, and it yep. definitely seemed to have gotten a little louder. Well, I remember when we had that mirage that we all love so dearly. Um, every time we broke a flex pipe in the rally cross, the check engine light would come on on the way home. So, yeah. Doesn't surprise me. And even that didn't really kill the fuel mileage that much. No, it's pretty good. <laughs> I, uh, I don't want to have another uh, same car as you, but man, that car is really endearing itself to you. And I like hearing about it and looking at it, and I really want one out too. <laughs> yeah. Uh, SR20 is to... a cool engine. All aluminum. Revs really fast. It's cool. Yeah, the car has been, like I said, the one time I drove the car was fun to drive. So I think that was pre suspension or just after suspension. Oh, no, I, I didn't remember. the suspension. I, I hadn't done maybe the sway bar. Anyway, I know it was a fun little car to drive, and it's kind of exactly what I'm like desiring in a daily. Like, oh, and the, and the AC is ice cold. Yeah, that's nice too. And uh, I, I actually just got. I found on eBay, researching the part number, the factory part number, a ABS sensor for it. Oh, excellent! For less than four hundred fifty dollars. Yeah, for seventy bucks. Nice. Now it's like. For like the 1.6 car in Europe, but I'm like, it's I got out of the box the here. I'm like, it's exactly the same. Yeah, and you had the same part number anyway, so. And for 20, and for, not for 20, for 70 bucks, I'll try it. Because once I get the one that's in there out, that's going to be the hard part. Changing a sort of new one shouldn't be a big deal if it doesn't work for some reason. And now you're less concerned about taking the old one out as well because you have a replacement part. Well, why would I take the old one out without a replacement one? Because you were talking about taking it out and cleaning it, remember? Oh, no, no. I, I did clean it. You oh, can take the... Work. It's... You just take the rotor off. It was right in there, and I cleaned oh, it. Oh, okay. Didn't work. I, didn't, I don't think we talked about that. Oh, I guess not. Oh. Yeah, I cleaned them all. Um, that was kind of dirty, but it just didn't do anything. So, um, I'm going to try to do that at some point. But anyway... So Excellent. that's that's what I was doing this evening. And, uh, you know, in, in between uh, sessions, I was talking on our Discord server. Well, not yeah, you're pretty active on there today. Yeah. So, um, yeah, if you guys, anybody that's listening, you're all welcome to come join. Just message us on, like, Instagram. We'll send you the link for it. And, uh, yeah, it's, it's definitely been fun. A lot of... A lot of talk every day, so I learned today about pre-cut laminex for my headlights. I didn't yeah, know they the, made like pre-cut shapes. Oh yeah the the fog light ones for the Volkswagen are pre-cut, and same for the Crosstrek. Well, I was looking at doing uh, the headlights over in Naomi's Hyundai Sonata because they're all kind of baked out from the sun. Yeah. So I was going to polish those up and then re-clear them. But if I polish them up and put that like actual UV protectant film on them, they might last a lot longer, I think. They might not have pre-cut ones for that car. They it's do. a lot of like enthusiast stuff. They do. I already looked. Oh, they do? Wow. Yep. I noticed yeah. There's on a lot Stephanie's of enthusiasts car, about Hyundai's, okay? All right. On it's a very car, the fogs, which are down low, are definitely like chipped up. And they kind of yeah, bubbled a little bit. From winter time. Uh, the film? You put film on them? Yeah. Okay. Well, winter time in New England is probably not kind to them. No, and I don't know. But how the good th news is the fog light underneath is probably fine. 
Yeah, I don't know how good the film is for heat. It's weird. It kind of like bubbled. I don't know. Well, I, mean, I don't know how long it's supposed to last bad. either. I don't think it's bad for heat because it's on a headlight housing. Uh, I don't they know. They get hot. Yeah, I, I don't know. It's, I don't know. Either yeah, way, I'll, great. I'll sand them and I will re-clear them and then I'll put the, the film on them. And if it lasts a year or two, great. If it doesn't, then I won't do it again. But it's worth a shot, right? Yeah. It could just be chewed up from rocks. I don't know. But the front of the car is really not super chewed up from rocks. So I, I think that like they get hot because... I know they're kind of close to the lens in a fog light. I don't know. Yeah. It's interesting. I wouldn't think that they'd have too much of a reaction there. Because it's the same material they sell, like the paint protection film. Like Laminex also sells paint protection film. So I mean, the ones in my Volkswagen look kind of similar. So. Oh, they're kind of beat up already? Mm-hmm. Hmm. Interesting. I don't know. I'll give it a try. They look really good because uh, Andy put them on the headlights of his Volkswagen. And yep. he restored those headlights and they look brand spanking new. So Hey, you'd see it if you were in the Discord server. Correct. That's how I, that's how I saw it. Um, I'm saying to the person who's listening who's not in the Discord server. Yes, I know. So the uh, I've considered doing the high beams yellow on the Moretz. Okay. The I don't know. And I think so a the, yellow... The, I think it would look odd. The two inner... Circles yeah. yellow. It looked very French. Yeah, I think the car is my. I, I don't know. I have to see it. I think a yellow so bulb. It's just, no, I think it would look. I mean, it's just film. You could just try yeah. it. <laughs> yeah, take it off. Yeah. Anyway, that's cool. I like the car. I like the. Uh, I'm jealous of your track days, and uh, I hope to keep hearing about more of them. So, speaking of racing, a couple things happened last weekend. Oh, yeah, we have a pedantic correction. Oh, yeah? What's that? We said Pikes Peak was this weekend. It was actually last weekend. Correct. But I'm going to blame their marketing. It's not very good. Yeah, their website is terrible. Honestly, even just now looking for the results, because I knew we were going to talk about it, it was hard to find the results of the event on their own website. Because they do like a blog. So they're all, so every time they post a new article, the other article gets kind of buried behind. And you think they'd just be like a link for results, but there wasn't. But we got there, so. But yeah, so it was Pikes Peak weekend and Goodwood, which is kind of a, a neat combo of events. I will say that Goodwood does a much better job with publicity and coverage, though, because you I think could, Goodwood kind of blasted <laughs> Pikes Peak out of the water. Is what happens? Yeah, well, you could you could log into YouTube and go to Goodwood's YouTube channel. And it was just live streamed all weekend. And then when the event was over at night, they just replayed the live stream. Mm-hmm. So you could watch it at any time, any given time. You had a couple, three minutes, sit down, watch some Goodwood. And it was the Goodwood, it's the Festival of Speed, not the Revival. So the Festival of Speed is the hill climb up Lord March's driveway, essentially, to his uh, mansion or castle or whatever it is, the top of the hill. And it's basically a historic hill climb with some modern stuff mixed in. And because it's not in America and they allow modern race cars to go up it because there's no litigious issues, it gets more and more insane every year. And I would say that this year was one of the most insane (laughs) displays of speed I've seen go up the hill. Yet the top five cars were only like, I mean, uh, seven seconds, I guess, is a long distance between the cars. But the car that won was light years ahead technology everything else but like second or third through fifth or sixth was you know separated by half a second and the cars were all ridiculous so very very cool event to watch unfold this weekend and a couple cool i think it, i can think of at least three cool race vehicles that debuted this weekend there so it was very cool to watch that was definitely uh I won't say glued to it because I was doing some other stuff, but the most I could watch it, I would watch it. It was a very entertaining event. The McMurty Spearling. I think that car deserves its its own conversation here, for sure. (laughs) Well, let's put it this way. Second place was 45.5 seconds. Yeah. And the McMurty did it in what? 39.08? Yeah. So when you're... 
six seconds, not even five and a half seconds faster than the Porsche 718 GT4 like hybrid car or full electric. I don't even know which one it was. I think it was a hybrid. I have to look. I could be wrong on that. We'll leave that alone. Anyway, you're five and a half seconds faster than a legit Porsche race car in a course that you did in only 40 seconds. That's an insane spread. Well, I believe it beat the Volkswagen ID4 or it's the, ID4, it, IDR. It has the fastest um, time. It's the record. Like, yeah, it's the new record of the hill. Which the IDR uh, also has the record of Pikes Peak. It does until yeah, next year when this McMurdy shows up. <laughs> yeah, so this thing's pretty crazy. It's just this like car building firm, <clears throat> just in the British countryside. Yeah, and and in and in typical British fashion, they were like super quiet about it, and they just showed up with this fully developed race car that, I mean, I had never even heard of before, and I think that we're fairly tuned into like car culture, you know. I don't think anybody really knew about it. Yeah, it was just all like secret James Bond stuff. <laughs> like it's... they built this ridiculous race car, <laughs> just like here we go, here it is. First, first of all, if you haven't watched the video, go on YouTube, watch the video. Yes. It looks sped up. It looks like the scene in Smokey and the Bandit where um, he drives the Trans Am through the S-curves with the track and trailer behind him. And they're both like bouncing up and down like crazy because the film is sped up so far. It looks like that, but it's not. It's just actual. The car is that fast. It, the, yeah, the, the movements gets, it makes don't even make sense. The part that gets me is when you're watching the video. And it whips by the crowd, and like the crowd realizes how fast it's going, and everybody's like, "Oh, yeah!" Like, <laughs> yeah, like you, 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 I immediately like looked at the flags that were like blowing in the breeze to see that the video wasn't sped up. <laughs> like it's just a normal speed video with this absurd car going by. Like they run Formula One cars up this hill, and they don't look anything like what this car looked like. No, I so a couple of things. It, its proportions are funny looking. It's a funnily proportioned car. It's like squat and short and narrow and tall. So it's weird looking. And that I think also adds to the illusion. But yeah. But it's, um, it's electric. Yep. And it's a fan car, which is also crazy. It's a fan car. Yes. Which there hasn't been a fan car used in competition since 1978 when the last one ran an F1. Um, I don't know what car it was, but it was, uh, I think it was a Brabham. Yeah. And I think it was only used for one year because they probably banned it for sure. And then prior to that, what was that first fan car? It was the Chaparral? That was a McLaren. I think a McLaren or a Chaparral. I think it's a Chaparral. I don't want to uh, speak... All right, look it up. So the the McMurty, I'll talk about the McMurty here. Chaparral 2J. Okay. Bam. Um, from the top of your website. So they say, first things first, it's not as big as you think. It's a single seater that could hide in the shadow of a Caterham. Which is ridiculous. It's tiny. Yeah. <laughs> it's all carbon. It's, it's a person yeah. with four wheels. Yeah. Um, it weighs just under 1,000 kilograms. Yeah, 2,300 pounds, I think it said. And Which is more than I expected. Has its own horsepower. Right. So it's a thousand pounds, a thousand kilograms, and it's a thousand horsepower. Yes. Yeah. Crazy. A thousand horsepower per ton. Almost. Spearling is Irish for thunderstorm. Which so that makes that a cool name. But an electric car, you wouldn't think of thunder. You'd think of that like a true like. Can't have, race car. can't have lightning without thunder. Right. But this thing... Was, the The fans make, what, 120 <laughs> decibels of noise? So I yes. guess thunder is an appropriate name. Yeah. It's, like, it's like jet taking off levels of sound. That's what they said here. It doesn't. It's not a quiet EV. It sounds like a, a jet. Yeah, it's ridiculous. Well, do you know how much downforce those fans are creating when the car is sitting still? Uh, okay. So 500 kilograms of negative lift from zero miles per hour. 
of, that's of negative lifts. That's 500 kilograms. That's about a thousand pounds or 1100 pounds or so. That's but so it's crazy. it's creating actually 2000 kilograms or 4,400 pounds of downforce when the car is sitting still before it even moves. That's no, the that's, actual measure of downforce five, that it's making. 500 kilograms of negative lift from zero miles per hour. Uh, the number I read said it was um, 2,000 while sitting still. Huh. Uh, who knows? It's a lot. Yeah. Either way, it's a lot. E- either number is absolutely ridiculous. Okay. So, so the uh, big thing- rear, hold on. So downforce oh, yeah. system without the use of the front or rear wing means twin yeah. fans provide an extra 2,000. Okay. At, at max, it's 2,000 kilograms of downward force available from a standstill. So at a standstill is when it's at 500 sitting still. And then at full chat, the car does 2,000 kilograms of downforce or 4,400 pounds on the car. That's twice the car's weight. Yeah. So by um, having no spoilers for downforce, you've reduced drag. Correct. That's why. That's one of the reasons why it's fast. Yep. It's so ridiculous. And it says that they claim, the company that built it claims a zero is an obscure number, a zero to 186 miles per hour in nine seconds. <laughs> Which is a lot. That must be a number in kilometers. That makes sense. Yeah. And they say, what, what do you mean? In kilometers? Like 100, 186 miles per hour must be like a, uh, a no, number. British. British, they do mile per hour. I know that. But, but what I'm saying is it's a weird number to make as your. Oh, oh, oh. You know what I mean? And then I don't know what a what's a Rymac Navara. That that's that, that takes eleven point eight seconds. That's that supercar thing that the Top Gear has crashed. Uh, Bugatti Chiron Super Sport is twelve point one. Yeah, uh, so one hundred eighty six miles per hour is three hundred kilometers per hour. Oh. So that's that's why they use that. That's what I figured. So, anyway, yeah, three hundred kilometers an hour or one hundred eighty six miles per hour ridiculous and i guess what they're doing with this they like they announced it last year i think at goodwood and then they showed up this year broke the record and then they're like yeah we're gonna build these you can buy them and also we're gonna take this one on the road and just break a bunch of records with it yeah so look for it at bike speak next year to annihilate the idr's record there as well i mean you can certainly do it because the battery they say here the battery life is like 30 to 60 minutes, depending on the racetrack, which if it goes up Pike's Peak in eight minutes. Well, say the less. record's like seven <laughs> minutes, right? So seven. Something. Seven. So if yeah. It, if it does it under eight minutes, then it's got plenty of battery. You can do it three times at least. <laughs> Crazy. It's, it's insane technology. And I guess the other cool thing about this car is they're planning on making street cars too. Yes. So absurd, of course. Well, they'll never be legal in the United States, I'm sure. But just absurd that they're even taking this technology and deciding to make a streetcar out of it. I don't understand sometimes why we need these streetcars, but hey, I'm not going to complain about it. It's pretty cool. I'd love to see one. Maybe uh, if we find out it's going to Bikes Peak next year, I'll have to make the the trek to Colorado to watch. Well, that cool would be street. interesting, too. Because, yeah, it's generating downforce, its own downforce through mm-hmm. fans, but you do have thinner air at Pike's Peak. So that's that would be pretty interesting to see. It just turns itself they, inside out. deal with that? <laughs> well, no, you just end up with less, you'd have less downforce. So there's a there's a control on the steering wheel, I guess, Yeah. that to, to turn the fan speed up or down. So mm-hmm. at thinner air, would it create less downforce with suction? I don't, I'm, well, not, I'm not a scientist. I don't know how that would yes, work. Yes, because oh, maybe not. I don't know. Or, yeah, exactly. The the cars, the, the 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 vacuum is just that. It's like in a vacuum. So I don't know if the thinner air would make a difference on that, and it would create more downforce because the car has less. I, I don't know. I suppose it. I'm not a scientist, <laughs> obviously. Well, you got to figure an airplane has to fly faster at higher altitude. Sure. The air is thinner to generate the same lift. So this is just working in reverse. So yeah, maybe, maybe, you'd, maybe it would work harder 
but you'd still right, but you're not, negative. but you're not generating the downforce through speed. It's through fans. Yes, which makes it different. You would need no. <laughs> you need to run the fans faster. Faster, to generate of course. The same. Yeah. Compensate for the. So you you might not get that max that they're talking about at sea level, but you'd still you'd still get some. Yeah, you'd you'd have enough for enough of the distance up the mountain to annihilate the record. So, <laughs> yeah, and that's interesting too because you know the fan car has been banned from every other kind of competition. I wonder if they'll you know asterisk all these records that it makes because it's a fan car. I don't think so because it's an unlimited class. They have an unlimited class. Yeah. <laughs> it's like experimental unlimited. It's just strange that they haven't run a fan car up Pikes Peak, if that's the case. I I bet they have. We just didn't dig deep enough into the the history things. here. I don't know. It's super cool. I'm here for it. I want to see one in person. I want to see one running somewhere. I want to see one, you know, break a record somewhere. Love to see one up, like, maybe even take on uh, Climb of the Clouds. Who knows? <laughs> that would be crazy. It would be insane. It would be cool to see, though. So, speaking of people who have run Climb the Clouds... Pastrana ran the family huckster at Goodwood. Yep. Which is also uh, amazing. That's like 800 something horsepower in that 83 quote unquote Super GL, GL. Uh, has active arrow. That, that car is really, really cool. It's uh, very did cool. Did you see the, did you see the uh, like startup of the dash, the digital dash? I don't the think UI did, they no. made. No. Oh, I'll find the video and send it to you. Okay. It, the UI looks like a uh, uh, 16-bit like Nintendo game. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. Well, for to put things into perspective, that McMurdy car ran a 39.08, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. Second place up the hill in a ridiculous actual Porsche race car ran 45.5. The Subaru GL family huckster ran... 46.2 so 45.5 to 46.2 is 0.7 so it's seven tenths of a second difference between a 718 gt4 and an 84 super gl that just tells you the kind of race car building skill that vermont sports car has because that's ridiculous i assume it's a yep. vermont sports that's a vermont sports car build right it is yeah it's yeah. so cool Seven tenths of a second between a brand spanking new Porsche race car engineered and developed by Porsche engineers in Germany and an 83 Subaru, quote unquote, re engineered by a bunch of guys in Vermont. Artisanal sports car building. I am way into it. It's super cool. The active arrow was ridiculous looking. Mm-hmm. It, it just, the car got like, it looked like a. <laughs> Uh, like a face hugger from aliens there all of a sudden like this, these things just opened up on it it was just strange looking mm-hmm. but obviously it worked so I'm excited to see that car do more things too I, I think there's a Gymkhana video being made with it I think I think it was made or there it hasn't come out yet either way it hasn't come out yet yeah because so I heard be there cool. was some there was something about him being hurt like he did some stunt with it and he like hurt himself Oh, okay. I had not heard so, any of that, or if I did, it was long enough yeah. ago that I forgot. Yeah, it was a while ago. Um, it's very, I didn't know it's, about it's, the Active Arrow until I saw it running Goodwood. I remember like, them talking about it when they were, I think I watched like the, the Hoonigan build breakdown of the car, but they didn't actually activate any of it or it wasn't functioning yet. So you didn't see how actually ridiculous it looked. Like they're basically air brakes. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, it's super it's really cool. cool. The other super cool thing that debuted at the hill this this time was the the Ford Supervan 4 because Ford Supervans are like my favorite things ever you know the Supervan 1 was a early Ford Transit like 1969 or 1970 that they just cut up and put on top of a GT40 and then I don't know what power in Supervan 2 and 3 but I know as a kid I had a Supervan 2 matchbox car and it was like my favorite thing because it was so ridiculous looking so it's cool they're still doing that program this time it was electric and that ran the hill in 46.5 so three tenths behind the family huckster so that was a super cool 
thing to see. And like I said, it's a little bit of a childhood, like nostalgia that they're still doing super vans. So I did that, but yeah, it was, it was, it was a cool event. And then they had some other stuff that was just, you know, stuff like Gran Turismo level cars, like the Dodge Viper GTSR. I assume you saw that one go up. The Group A Skyline. No, I it. Okay, so it was the blue, the blue Viper GTSR with the you know the yellow head, the yellow headlights and the f- driving lights in the bomber to Le Mans car. And they had oh, okay. um, the Nissan Primera from BTCC. Driven by the old the driver who drove it in the nineties, Anthony Reed. That was super mm-hmm. cool. Uh, I got to see the Calsonic R thirty two GTR, the JGTC car. I mean, just some super neat stuff. And then I only saw you know a portion of it. I didn't get to see everything. So there'll be more to see. Everybody wants to know though, Andrew, where did the Gallant finish. I don't know because I couldn't find it. And did it run the hill or did it run the rally stage? It ran the hill. Okay. Maybe I looked it up in the wrong place to try to figure out where it was. Yeah, it's not it's not listed on the results. Of it. So yeah, it's really weird. It definitely ran and people sent me screen grabs of it running, but like it's not listed in entry car. Yeah, I like there were pictures of it. Me. Like I saw on Twitter. Oh, and this was what was crazy is I saw pictures of it, and they're also running Pro Race three wheels that I run on my car. I because didn't know anybody else ran them on my car. On the most car. currently available wheel that looks like the old uh, Rally Art wheels. Yeah, well, they're not even available anymore. They stopped making them. So. Oh, did they? That's thanks. Yeah. I think um, my favorite one to watch go up the hill was the uh, Toyota Hilux to car. Just because oh, yeah. it was, was going to roll over, so ridiculous watching it dive into the turns, and that was driven by the guy who won the car. I think Nasser Alatia, Nas- Nasser Alatia, Al- yep. yeah, yep. So that was that was. It wasn't very fast. No, you know, it was probably one of the slowest cars of the day, but it was just absolutely ridiculous to see it running wow. up a hill yeah. on pavement. It's made to go fast in the desert, not up a paved hill. For sure. I mean, it's funny they have a rally stage as well. It was probably I, too big for the rally stage. Yeah, it could have been. I didn't get to see a lot of what happened there. I saw the Celica go across and uh, one of the one of the newer Imprezas. But it was the RA40 Celica, so it's a second-gen Celica in the Team Toyota colors. Super cool car. It said there was a Starion, too, but I don't know where that went. I didn't see that either. Yeah, I didn't know weird. what it was. I'm sure there's something somewhere that has all this stuff, but I just haven't found it yet. But it was super cool. I'm into it every year. That's like a super bucket list trip. Except I was trying to decide the other day. We were actually talking about it at work. What would you rather go to? The Goodwood Festival of Speed, the hill climb? Or the Goodwood Revival with all of the vintage racing all weekend and all the vintage drivers and the car show and everything? If you had to pick one. Festival of Speed. Would you? Yeah. I I chose Revival. I like the more modern race cars that show up. Okay. I'm obsessed with the chrome bumper race cars being driven bumper to bumper. There you go. So, and they do every year, they do the Mustang versus mini race, which is super cool to me. So you get to see the, the minis really dicing it up in the turns. The Mustangs blown by them in straightaways. And it's just, it's, it's a very cool back and forth with those, those races, seeing where they can pass. And I love to see that in person. I think that'd be awesome. So, but yeah, I I think I'd rather go to Revival if I had to choose one, just because it's kind of an all encompassing thing. They have the huge show and they have the, the the military stuff from that back then too, as well as the race cars and it's all. I don't know what the cutoff date is for that, but the vintage motorcycles and the one it's thing like I fifty four or something, isn't it? No, nah, it's later than that because it's Mustangs. It's it's got to be up to almost seventy, if not beyond. It's probably like sixty four or something. Yeah, I think it's a little later than that. I'll have to look it up. But it's definitely some certain late 60s, I would say, is as late as it goes. So one thing I did notice at the Festival of Speed was they don't run the motorcycles up the hill. Uh, they, I don't know. They ran them all in. I was like, oh, sweet, motorcycles. And then they ran them all in slow formation, and they waved at the crowd the whole time. I was like, well, that was very anticlimactic. 
I don't know if it's too dangerous or or what, but I mean, I they know, run the Isle of Man, which is also yeah, last they, weekend. Yeah, they Isle of no, Man. Which was one of the deadliest ones in modern history, which is not good. But yeah, they, anyway. I mean, they're running all sorts of stuff there. They're running electric bikes too now. Yeah, it's, it's the speed there is... I, I don't know how much longer that event can run. <laughs> it's just so ridiculous. I think they were seven deaths this year or Jesus. crazy. Yeah, it was it was definitely at least five. And then I heard about two more and I wasn't clear if they were actually at that event or a different event. But yeah, insane. So going back to the United States, we had the Pikes Peak Hill Climb, which we haven't talked about yet. Yeah, because it was hard to find uh, results. So the big news there and all the stories and everything were because Hoonigan is a media giant and their stuff dominated all the stories I could find. And it was hard to find stories that weren't about the fact that the Hoonigan car couldn't run up the hill, which is kind of annoying because I wanted to know what actually did happen, not what didn't happen. So I guess the big story... Did we talk about that last week? We did, right? That the Huna Pegasus BRI, we covered that oh, yeah. already. Yeah. yeah. So the event did go off even without, you know, Sir Ken Block. So the winning vehicle was a dedicated race car, of course. And it did it in 1009. So obviously we're nice. talking about a much bigger race here than the Festival of Speed. But 10 minutes and 9 seconds, which is nowhere near a record. So what was the hundredth running of the event, though? It was the hundredth anniversary. Yeah, the record is still held by the Volkswagen IDR at seven fifty-seven, which is so the Sperling shows up, right? But what I'm saying is the fact that the fastest car there this year was three minutes slower than the record mm-hmm. is. Yeah, tells you the level of that IDR, and if that Sperling can beat that IDR, it will just tell you the level of how ridiculous that the McMurdy Sperling is. So it's, well, it beat it at Goodwood, but I guess the IDR is a very big car. It's very wide, and, and that that helped the Sperling being so small helped it at the very narrow Goodwood hill climb. Yeah, so especially at the top of the hill where there's the big like cement wall on the left. Yeah, and you see every car get like hucked into there real hard. The Sperling is so small it almost made it straight. Right. Yeah, you know, there wasn't a lot of movement going on. It would be so, good for uh, climb the clouds because that is a small road. Yep, it's a very, it's a very, very good choice. I'd like to see it there. Yeah, just set records everywhere and retire, <laughs> retire champion. But who knows? There's, there's got to be a limit of how fast these things can go. But I guess people say that every year, right? The first time somebody did ten minutes flat up Pikes Peak, they're like, "That's it, can't go any faster." Yeah, I mean it's the. It's the EV, right? There's no, uh, there's no altitude penalty. There's no right. like you know you have 100 percent torque at zero RPM or whatever. Yep, at every RPM. Yeah, and at every alt- altitude doesn't matter. Yeah, so, yeah. Pike Speak was it, it, stuff I've been able to find was cool. I haven't been able to find a lot of information. I don't know of any important things that happened. I didn't see anything like super, there's no records. There was no cars that were, you know, debuted or anything this year. So I've seen just uh Reese Millen running the Toyota car as sort of like a throwback, the Tagoma. Yeah, that's cool. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. Reese Millen actually, he finished sixth overall in a Porsche, but then he also did that Toyota truck as well. I don't know if that was a time run or if it was like an exhibition thing or. Yeah. I mean, I know they timed them anyway, but I think it was a exhibition event. The cool thing is that the dudes who went to Climb to the Clouds with that 98 Paseo. Yeah. They were also at uh, Bikes Peak. Oh, that's cool. Yep. Unfortunately, they didn't, they didn't, uh, didn't make it, but. I think it sounded good though. Yeah. Oh, it broke. It was so oh. loud. <laughs> Paseo is such a strange choice. I know, but it like tickled your brain i don't know it was like so loud yeah it was very cool yeah unfortunately they didn't uh they didn't make it but they tried that's cool because they're like from brazil or somewhere they're not even 
in the States. So anyway, I don't have a lot of info about Bikes Peak, unfortunately. I figured with the hundredth anniversary it would have been a lot more pomp and circumstance and a lot more coverage, but it's been again all the coverage we saw was from Hoonigan or for Festival Speed. So anyway. Any other uh, motorsport stuff you've watched? Um, no. Cool. Oh, well, you know what we forgot to talk about uh, two weeks ago was the race at Sonoma. God, it was two weeks ago. I don't remember what happened now. Or was it three weeks ago? Well, yeah. Suarez run. Uh, Suarez won. That's true. Yeah. That was really cool. It was, otherwise it wasn't a super exciting race. He kind of. He kind of got out front towards the end and kind of just held on to it and had a, had a good car and just drove away and is also a really good road course driver. So Yeah, he really is. Speaking of road course drivers, that's who won this week, but at Nashville Speedway was um, Chase Elliott at a non-road uh, course. Yeah, it was actually it was a very, very fun race to watch. There was a ton. Of there was a ton of back and forth. Yeah, it was like a three or four hour rain delay. It probably finished at yeah, midnight that's, Eastern. Yeah, <laughs> that's why I that's why I stopped watching it because it was just on rain delay. So yeah, it was it was a great event to watch. It was uh, there was a lot of passing. There was a lot of back and forth. There was a lot of pit strategy. It just it was a very entertaining race, and I I am a big Chase Elliott fan, so I was happy to see him win. It is actually second oval this year. He hasn't won a road course this year, but he has won two oval races, which is weird. Mm-hmm. So. Uh, project car updates. I did something I've never done before. Oh yeah, you. I don't even want to know what you're gonna guess. So <laughs> I'm just gonna say I fixed the air conditioning in a car. So okay. I, I was gonna I, say let go of a car you don't need. I fixed the air conditioning in a car that I recently <laughs> purchased that I don't need. So in the 944, uh, one of the things that was non-functional when I bought the car was the air conditioning. Yeah. I've never fixed air conditioning. We live, or I used to live in New England, obviously. It was never as big of a deal because the amount of days you need it, you just wouldn't drive the car. But here, if you don't have air conditioning, you just park the car all summer, like you park a car all winter there. So I wanted to fix it. I did, I took it to a Cars and Coffee Saturday morning without air conditioning. And it was fine on the way there, but on the way home, I was like, oh my God, I'm probably going to die. I need to fix the air conditioning of this car because it's very hot. Hmm. Probably not actually going to die. Probably being a little dramatic, but nonetheless, it was quite warm. Uh, The car ran nice and cool, but I was quite warm inside. So also my phone overheats like immediately with noisy in the car. It doesn't work at all. So talked to uh, Naomi's son, Jordan, who is an air conditioning guy. He knows how to fix the stuff. Um, He has the vacuum pump and the gauge set up in order to uh, vacuum the system and refill the system. He came over, looked at the car. I couldn't even tell you if a car before this weekend, I couldn't tell you if a car has R134 or R12. I don't know how to tell. I know how to tell. I know how to tell now. So that's good. It's the fittings. It's the fittings. If they're two different sizes, then you have R134. So you can't mix up and put um, the suction side on the... Well, it's it's also the two different sizes. So the the high and low side, the fittings are two different sizes. You can't do it backwards either. So... Yeah. Anyway, turns out that the car had been converted to R134 already prior to my ownership. I was unclear if it had or not. And I then, after the fact, found a sticker on the passenger side inner fender that was all in German that has the date and where it was done on it. So it was done at a Porsche dealership in Germany sometime in the 80s or early 90s. When did they switch to R134? In the 90s. So the 90s. Mm-hmm. So the car obviously was still in Germany until R134 was a thing. So that's cool. So it had already been converted. But when they converted it, they didn't change both fittings. They only changed one. Seems weird. Strange, right? I bet someone pulled the compressor off. 
Well, you said that that car had engine work at one point. It did. Somebody like put the wrong compressor in it or something. So here's the thing: you cannot put a standard R134 fitting on the compressor and make it work. It doesn't fit because it goes against the engine. There's not enough room for it because it's it's bigger than the R12 style fitting. So in order to make it work, we had to buy a fitting for the 134 that not only was the correct fitting but had a 90 degree elbow in it Mm -hmm. so maybe they weren't available back in the 90s when this happened and they just did it they wouldn't be able to convert it i don't know it's weird anyway the the fittings are different for so you don't mix the two freons and so that's my point is that somebody maybe thought it needed a compressor or replaced the compressor or something oh maybe I don't know, but I had to put a fitting on it. So we put a fitting on it, a 90 degree fitting. And then you actually have to clock the compressor like 45, somewhere between 45 and 90 degrees to the left on the adjusting rod, which actually brings it, it makes the belt much shorter too. So I had to buy a shorter belt by one inch. So we clocked the compressor, put the fitting on it, put the belt, the shorter belt on the car and charged the system after you know vacuuming everything out of it and then recharged it and it blows cold so it read 29 point something degrees on my little infrared thermometer at the vent Mm. which is pretty cold yeah so it uh, seemed to go pretty well fast forward to monday morning i just said you know what it has air conditioning i'm gonna drive it to work so I drove it to work, all was well, air conditioning the whole way there and back. We also put dye in the system in case it is leaking and that's why it wasn't working before. And we'll be able to find out where, where it's coming from. Driving back from work, it seems like there's some kind of stress on the compressor maybe at low RPM. You can feel it like with the AC on, you can kind of, it doesn't sound right. So I'm not sure if the compressor might actually be on its way out or if it's just the way it's going to be. But I don't I don't remember feeling that on the way to work, just on the way home. Uh, but it did work the whole time. So you can literally feel the vibration through the car at lower RPM from what feels like the actual compressor spinning. And then you turn well, the AC off, it stops immediately. Could have the wrong oil in it. Hmm. I don't know. I doubt it, but... Well, uh, I don't doubt it because who knows who touched it before and it it could have the wrong oil in it. Even if you guys put oil in it and you mix the wrong oil, it doesn't have good results. And so it might be eating itself, but we'll we'll find out if it stops working. Yeah, exactly. Best part about that, fortunately, unfortunately, it is an available part. Uh, if it does go bad, I can buy a new one. It's not terribly expensive. And the belt is only for the air conditioning. So if something happens, I can just take the belt off and drive home. Just warm. Yeah. So it's not the end of the world. So I, I got to get out under there and start the car and idle it and play in the driveway and see if I can figure out what it is. So that's Did it not have a belt weekends. on it before? It did have a belt on it before. Okay. But it had the longer so, belt on sometimes it. Sometimes I'm always like... If it doesn't have a belt on it, you're like, ooh. Nope, it it has a belt on it. And again, when it's off, it spins totally freely. So I'm not sure. And it's only at low RPM that I heard it, so I don't even know exactly what's going on yet. It might not even be a problem. It might just be something else, you know? I got to go through it It might just be the way it works. Yeah, but I don't think it was doing it before. That's the problem. So I don't know. Again, I've only driven it one time with air conditioning, so... I need to do a little more digging, but the, the beauty of it is that I now know how to, I now know how to do air conditioning. Uh, I now also own a vacuum pump and gauges so that I can do it on other cars. So that's good to have. So I also will be looking at the air conditioning system in both the Sapporo and the Cressida because neither of them have air conditioning and both of them have already been converted prior to my purchasing to R134. So shouldn't be hard to make them work again. Yeah, you have to be careful if they've been open. You got to change the, the receiver dryer, stuff like that. Sure. They haven't been open to like 
I mean, open is like no fluid in them. You mean no, no gas in them? Well, you don't know if that. They, they, yeah, they could be open to the atmosphere. Right. Well, they have caps on and everything, so. Yes, but the reason why they don't work if they don't have free if they don't have a charge in them means they are open to atmosphere. Right. Which the receiver dryer is filled with desiccant that absorbs moisture. So if it just absorbs a bunch of moisture, then it's no good anymore. Right. Well, first things first, I see if the compressors even work. I've never even touched them, you know? When so. you put the vacuum pump on them to vacuum the system, mm-hmm. uh, it boils all the moisture out of the system if there's any water in there. Any right. Vapor. Yeah, it's supposed to clean everything out so you can put it back in clean. Yeah. So, anyway, I'm still learning. Again, only done one car and uh, didn't do it by myself. Had, uh, Jordan was here doing it with me, so... I need uh, to learn some more about it because, again, it's, it's all automatic transmissions and air conditioning systems to me were just magic. So I just need to learn a few more things about it. But I have the stuff to at least do it now, you know? So. It's just a heat exchanger. Sure. And worst case scenario, I break a system that's already broken, right? So screw it. <laughs> wasn't planning on driving the cars anytime soon anyway because it's been so hot. So, and the Eclipse has gold AC, and another, another 944 does. So, I have two cars I can go to events in with air conditioning. So, anyway, that's the extent of my project car stuff. Yeah, I just tried some. We've been. Now is the Porsche when we do detail talk. Um, yeah, we talked about Porsches. Now it's time for detail talk. Yeah, you guys uh, kind of got me into the chemical guys stuff. I've been looking for like a good leather cleaner because of the stupid leather interior in the Gallant and the Q45 is leather. So I tried the chemical guys leather stuff. It's weird because it like seems to have actually absorbed into the leather on the Gallant. Okay. Like I did it and then came back like an hour later and you can see where some spots were dull and some spots were still shiny. Like it soaked in and then I did it again and the same thing happened. Has it made it? noticeably softer it feels a little softer okay i mean i don't think you can do anything about like where it gets like kind of like looks like sandpaper i don't know yeah it's more and pretty good that's not the actual that's not moisture at that point that's just actually cracked on top yeah I don't, leather is just a stupid material to make seats out of yeah it really is it's weird and that it's sold as a luxury item because it wears out so fast too and uh well and like it's different from like a leather couch in your house because I don't think a leather couch in your house has like I, I feel like automotive leather is sealed to like prevent moisture from getting into it. I'm not sure. I, I know the, the I don't I don't know. One it's of the really big differences weird. is the fact that in your car it's subject to extreme temperatures. It gets cold. It gets hot. It gets you know it's a lot. It's a lot harsh it's sitting in the sun all the time. It's a lot harsher of an environment than a leather couch in your living room. Yeah. <laughs> Excuse me. I don't. Uh, I don't like leather seats at all. I don't think I own anything with leather seats. I would. Yeah, I really want to change the lot to cloth. But and the same with the Montero because the leather in the Montero is completely destroyed. Um, but anyway, the leather in the Q45 is in a really nice shape, and I'd like to keep it in nice shape. So this stuff did seem to like clean off dirt. Like I use like they have a cleaner and. You, know, you clean it with the microfiber. My God, don't clean. I mean, clean your steering wheels, but don't look at the towel. It's disgusting. Yeah, it's gross. <laughs> um, and that's the other thing. So on the steering wheel in the in the Q45, it seemed to soak into the leather on that, but it's like not really soaking into the seats. Like the seats are just like shiny. Okay. A little bit softer. I don't know. It's kind of weird. But they feel softer though. They feel softer. Yeah. And the smell and- nice. And it's a protectant, like a like a wax at that point too. It helps helps the things last longer as well. Yeah, because you're, you're moisturizing. Probably, yeah. You know? yeah, and it's probably it's never been vitamin- done. Yeah, it's putting vitamin E back into the seats. I'm like, okay. sure, it's, yeah. it seems a little snake oily, but and so that's there the problem are. with any of these detail products is that they seem a little snake oily because that's how they sell them. So mm-hmm. at the end of the day, if they work, I'm glad. I don't care about all the other. Hours it goes along with it, but 
you know, the Q45 seats might have never been done and you just kind of need three or four applications of it to kind of get anywhere possibly too. Yeah, I'll probably do another so, another set this week. And, and like I said, with any of that Chemical Guy stuff, just read the directions because it's so different from stuff we're used to. Uh, yeah, I felt that's what I did. I was following the directions on it. Yeah. Because you don't rub it off. You just rub let it, it sit. in and let it sit. And like I said, it just soaked into the leather in the Galant. But like the seats in the q 2 are just like shiny. It's weird. Hmm. But, they're not more slippery, are they? No, they're not. That's good. I don't know. Yeah, I don't have much experience with, with any kind of leather maintenance. I don't really have... I, I don't think I've owned a car with a real leather interior. Lots of vinyl, but never anything leather. I would certainly prefer whatever my Volkswagen has, the leatherette. Which yeah, plastic. Wear really, yeah. <laughs> yeah, my Volkswagen had that too, and with 95,000 miles on it, and it was still brand new looking. It was, and it was a light beige, like biscuit colored, and it was still brand new. So no complaints. I, I take that every time. Plus, I'm sure it's better for the environment than cowhide, right? Mm-hmm. Probably not as plastic, but you know what I mean. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Who knows? The straw argument at that it's, point, probably. It's, it's better for me, my obsessive compulsiveness over having yes. a nice interior. That's what it's better for. Easier to clean. Easier to keep. Yeah, I don't care about the natural wear of leather. Like, no, it's it's worn. It's not an appeal to me. Yeah, it's, I don't want I don't want worn out things. I don't want natural well, wear. Like, yeah, in a. In a car interior, I don't like it. In a, a jacket, in a nice, different story. Yeah. yeah, a nice jacket, a nice chair in my house. <laughs> like, I don't different know. Different story. Just does, I just don't like it in an interior. No, no, it's not It's not good. The only time it's good is if it's like a 1965 Jaguar that has the original leather and it's all worn in worn nice. Worn from like race use or something. Sure, or it's worn from regular use for like 50 years. Yeah. And you didn't buy it brand new. Anytime you buy something brand new, anytime it gets worn, it's annoying. <laughs> yeah. If you got it old and used and it was worn like nicely, it'd be fine. The problem is most leather doesn't last long enough to look worn. I think it just winds up being torn for anything else because the, the yeah, bolsters of the seats get torn and then where you sit it gets torn. Apart. Yeah. It's just it's not the seams all split. Like, you know, I have lots of cars from the 80s and 90s with cloth interiors and no split seams. And anytime you see an 80s or 90s car with a leather interior, all the seams just split. So because it shrinks and grows. Yeah. And yeah, it's the terrible. passenger seat and the glot is split. Um, if you, it's funny because I can't see it because it's on the inside of the bolster that's closest to the driver's door, but it's like completely through to the foam on the Montero. Sure. And, uh, Actually, my Gallant, which I forgot I own, does have leather. And the white Starion does have leather. And the white yeah. RX-7 does have leather. So I do have cars with leather, but <laughs> I forgot. I thought I had none. I probably have three. <laughs> yeah. Everything else is vinyl or cloth. Oy. But, yeah, I don't know. I got a sticker for on the Q45, so that's good. Oh, a special sticker. Yep, that's good. Yep. He did not hear your exhaust leak? Or didn't he care, didn't. one or the other? He, I don't think he heard it or didn't care. There was another customer in there that was getting his Harley inspected. And they were too interested in talking about the guy's Harley while he was doing my inspection. So he just didn't. Awesome. <laughs> he, like, check the front suspension and, like, check the lights and the belts. And that was about it. Yeah, he shook your wheel. It shook like crazy. He put it back to the ground forgot all about it. <laughs> <laughs> it did not shake like crazy. I know. Fix that. <laughs> So that's actually something I did do too. Was I uh, did a suspension check on the 944 while I had all the jacks and everything out. So it's all good. All good. How's that Cressida? Which Cressida? The How's one that? I haven't touched in a while. I haven't touched it in a while. The beige one. Yeah, it's good. It's the backyard. Don't worry about it. It's right. actually that's uh, that's this weekend's plan. Last weekend I had a plan. I stuck to it. I did it. This weekend's plan is to do the Buy intake. another project car to ignore other project cars? No, it's to go back to the Cressida. <laughs> now, that, now that the 944 is at a point where I just need to... The windshield's getting changed up tomorrow, actually. And I need to do an oil change and some... Is it your guy? You get your windshield guy? <sighs> no, I did not. Okay. So, short version of a long story. 
the car is still insured in Bradley's name because he broke the windshield and he said he was going to put a claim in or they had a claim put in already. Okay. So they put the claim in and it got put in through Safe Light. So my fingers crossed that it'll all be well and uh, I'm going to pretend I don't know anything about glass companies and that Safe Light is just a company to use and let them do it. And if they screw it up, then I'll make them fix it. So they do the windshield tomorrow and if that all goes well, I'll have the, this weekend, I'll do the oil change and a couple other things and that car will be all done. But it's a three day weekend, so I'm going to plan on working on the beige Cressida as well. So, yep. to stick to the plan, that's what's next because that car needs to be running and driving. And also, actually, Sunday, I'm um, going, going back to the Honda, which is not at my house, and we're going to do the valve adjustment because I didn't think about that until after the car was all together. So, I'm going to do the valve adjustment this Sunday. Didn't get a chance last weekend to do it. So, that is the plan. So it's, there's, oh, there's definitely, that what's that? You're not going to take the head off? I'm going to try to do a valve adjustment first. So I was talking to Ron about it. I don't know if I talked to on a podcast or not. And he's like, well, if the head came out of every car, then maybe the valves are just, they just was so far out that it's only making a little bit of compression and not full compression. And if it's even across the board, maybe it's because they're all off the same amount. I was like, oh, that could be, I guess. So. Yeah, my dad didn't think so, but. Well, it's worth a shot. It's worth a shot because it's free. Before I take the head off and pay money to have it gone through, to at least try that, right? I I think I'd be, I'd be silly not to at this point. It'll take you know what an hour to do it, and then go from there. And if it's not, then I'll rip the head off and bring it to the machine shop. So both of those things will happen this weekend. Hopefully, only one of them. Hopefully, it is just out of adjustment and it will start. But if it's not. I'll pull the head off as well. So this weekend will be a busy car stuff weekend. So much more news next week. Hopefully good news. But trying not to ignore All things, right. Andrew. I do I do appreciate you keeping me honest there, but trying not to ignore things. Mm-hmm. So just ignoring my pleas to not buy any more project cars. I'm not buying any more project cars. I don't I I am officially out of room, Andrew. There's okay. Okay. there's a strict um, one car in one car out policy at the moment, so, and as I stated many times before, it was two cars out, one car in. So, anyway, moving on. I'm not going to justify yep. myself anymore. We can carry on. Where can they find us on social <laughs> media, Andrew? All right, Facebook, uh, on off topic podcast, on off topic on Instagram. <laughs> oh, excuse me. <clears throat> Rough week today. Yeah, I caught a little bug there. Auto off topic on Instagram. Auto off topic on Twitter. You can follow me, Race and Anger, on Instagram and Twitter. And Brad, where can they find you? They can find me on Instagram at TSISS350. I did forget to mention that I did, unfortunately, only passengering, but spent a day up in the mountains of Arizona in a brand new Supra. Ooh. Yeah, that was... Uh, Man, you're so fancy. You get Porsche. You ride around a brand new Supra. Right. I ri- get to ride around a $65,000 Supra, and then that night go home and drive my, like, four-digit thousand nine forty four. But it was a cool car. I, I don't, I've don't. i never really paid much attention to them because of their price point and because of their automatic transmission. But honestly, the car's a rocket. It's super comfortable. It is really... From the passenger seat, it was a super cool car, and I would love to get a chance to go in one as a driver. But I, uh, I had a good day, just you know, passengering up through eighty nine, the back way into Prescott, and through all the switchbacks up the mountain, through like Yarnell and all that part of Arizona. It was a, a super cool day with some cool pictures, and got to uh, spend a day with my buddy Derek and just hang out. It was good. So there'll be some pictures coming from that drive on the Instagram page. There's already one posted to my page at TSI SS350, but I'll do a little, put a little more up on the auto off topic page when Derek's video goes live. So Derek does uh, video reviews on YouTube and his channel, yeah. There Will Be Cars, will have the video of the Supra and our drive from the day. So once that video goes live, I'll post more so we can all be kind of together at the same time. So try to help him out with our views and help his views out with us and share share people that follow both, you know? So it should be good. 
but and there might be some more videos coll- collaboration between us as well in the future so we talked about some ideas so good stuff all right cool um i had one other thing but i forgot so it doesn't matter excellent um yeah well happy fourth people yeah next episode will be after the fourth uh i think we've got something planned for that so it'll be a surprise because i don't want to say it because then if it doesn't happen uh, correct it's a yeah yeah i won't say i was gonna say something but that's too much so i yeah. won't say anything we'll keep it I, we'll keep it to ourselves I, you might not have to listen to just us yes just to that <laughs> um my dog might bark in the background up. yeah um yeah, that's about it. Sorry. We're just like rambling on here at the, the end here. Anyway, cut it. Finish it. It's over. Aim for the roses. Yeah. As always, keep cars analog and aim for the roses. Yeah.